websites where where will ha 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 to which we get later <laughs> cut bitte danke I really wish we would have planned a little better and would have known one or the other thing before starting a Via Francigena. That could have saved us a little bit of money, but definitely a lot of nerves. Welcome to a little Via Francigena survival guide. First of all, don't worry, you're very likely to survive the Via Francigena as it is a pretty easy path to walk, at least the stretch that we did. If you're a kind of fit person and have a pretty decent condition, then you will have no troubles walking it. So all the advices I'm gonna give you now are just for the Luca to Rome part as that's the part we did and um, it wouldn't make any sense to give you advices for the rest of the trail. In the description you will find a lot of links that will help you to organize and plan your Via Francigena no matter where you are starting or ending. Well, let's start from the beginning. So Luca is pretty easy to reach by train or bus. If you check the site trenitalia.com, you will find your train from wherever you arrive from. Many of you will arrive in Italy by plane or bus, I guess. So the closest bigger cities reachable by either of them are Pisa, Livorno, Florence, Bologna and also La Spezia. You can book tickets for the train directly on the site but I would recommend downloading the app, especially if you plan on using the train in Italy more often. As well, you can get all the tickets at the station. Even if you're arriving, for example, in Rome, don't worry. Italy has a pretty good and fast train connection, so you can get there from nearly everywhere in the country in less than a day. If you already are holding your pilgrim's passport or a credential, then you even get a discount on some of the train route. Which brings us to the next point. The credential is the paper that identifies you as a pilgrim. You will need it to get into the pilgrim's accommodations to get discounts at, for example, museums or whatever, or get pilgrim's menus at various restaurants. The credential, if stamped at least once daily, qualifies you to receive the testimonium at the end of your journey. You can get your credential per mail in advance, so you already bring them with you when you start. You can buy it at various distributors, one or two will be linked in the description, or you can buy them at many tourist offices or other facilities along the Via Francigena. In Luca, you can buy it, for example, at Francigena Entry Point, the tourist center, or the museum of the Cathedral di San Martino. Check opening hours in at once. Like mentioned before, you, you should stamp it at least once daily so that you can receive your testimonium at the end of the journey. The person who stamps it should usually write the date beneath the stamp, if not, just write it yourself. You get the stamps at accommodations, museums, tourist offices, the town halls, so the municipalities, bars or restaurants, and even in some shops. Also keep your eyes open for signs that say Timbro, the Italian word for stamp. Let's get to the Via Francigena app. Positive things first, it's free. No, it's not that bad, it could be better. So there is this one Via Francigena app that everybody uses. And it has it, its good things, but also some bad things, but it definitely helps on your way. It shows you the stages from Canterbury to Rome and even beyond if you want to walk further south. It shows you how far the stages are it shows you accommodations along the route. Well, that's pretty much it. What I don't like about the app is that it does not show you an elevation profile, which in my opinion for a hike is even more important than the distance. Now, to relativize this, there are nearly no stages on this stretch with a huge amount of ups and downs, but anyway, it would just be good to know, I think. If you are a friend of books, there are also guidebooks, I will set a link into the descriptions. We didn't use any guidebook for navigation, we mainly used the app or even Google Maps. Definitely not winter. Well, we were pretty lucky as we had mainly good weather and only one or two rainy days, but you can also be not as lucky. The downside is that many accommodations are closed in winter. 
also some of the restaurants and museums, points of interest, whatever. According to the official page, they recommend May to June and September as the best season to hike. For me, it's hard to say. The positives in low season is there are nearly no people, which is a positive thing for me as I'm pretty much stressed out in the last few years by people. But some people also would like to connect to others, so this can be a positive or negative thing for you. The downside is a lot of places are closed, as I mentioned earlier. It won't be cheaper because of the season, as at least Pilgrim's accommodation prices stay the same the whole year. That can, of course, be different with bed and breakfast or hotels. Summer is very hot and many stages don't offer much shadow, so this is probably not the best uh, season. It really depends on your personal needs and preferences, but mainly you can walk the Via Francigena from Luca to Rome the whole year. This is maybe one of the biggest questions most of you have. We're gonna show you what we brought with us and how much sense that made and what we wouldn't bring anymore. Also, keep in mind that we are traveling long term, so not everything we brought with us makes perfect sense, but was important for us. So here you basically see all the stuff I carried with me during the Via Francigena. Let's start with the backpack. It's an ultra lightweight backpack from Osprey, the Levity 60, only 850 grams. I really like this backpack. The only thing, because it's so lightweight, you have to be very careful with it because it also rips pretty easy. Then of course, the clothes, my jacket with which I just worked and now it's super dirty. Then I had, of course, underwear and t-shirts, short pants. Of course I also had pants with me and a hoodie and a beanie. Rain cover for the backpack, the whole essentials like deodorant, solid soap for showering and also for a shampoo, toothbrush, toothpaste, um, a little first aid kit for hiking, this is like my travel pharmacy or we had a lot of the blister plasters with us and that's the only ones that are left over. Then all the stuff I need for making the videos, my, my camera box with uh, batteries and SD cards, my microphone, the power bank, my laptop, the, the laptop charger, the phone charger, sleeping bag and the mattress. I never used the mattress during the during the hike but I just wanted to be on the safe side because I also saw that some people were sleeping only on the floor at some at some pilgrims accommodations we took it with us but the mattress we never used the sleeping bag frequently because in most of the pilgrims accommodations you don't get a blanket you just get a pillow if you're if you're lucky and so you can just use your own sleeping bag. Of course traveling towel and um, a scarf because it was really cold at some times. Um, a headlight which I don't think was really necessary but it's always good to have one just in case. Uh, headphones for music. This is sunscreen that's a really cool company it's I think it's based in, in Munich. They make sunscreen which is not bad for the environment, not bad for sea life and for the corals and stuff which most of them are. New layer, check them out. My brush which mainly Amy used but it was okay. <laughs> then this is Life Straw, this is a, a filter bottle, you usually have the, this filter inside this bottle and it filters a lot of stuff, also check them out, they're really cool. Then my travel diary, this one was maybe the most useless stuff. Camping stove, including the pot. We didn't use it once, mainly because I forgot, I forgot the gas first. We found this one. Most of this is essential. The only thing that is absolutely not necessary is the, the, the gas stove because you have so many restaurants, but of course you can take it with you. And then of course, depending on how frequently you film, you make pictures, whatever, you may need or may don't need all these um, 
electric stuff. By the way, these are the shoes I use. These are Sketches. I think they are running shoes. They are very, very comfortable. So this is a huge topic and it was the topic along the Via Francigena which stressed me out the most, I think. To find accommodations along the Via Francigena, it can be tricky sometimes. A big problem we had was that we timed our hike exactly with a national holiday per week. We had Christmas, New Year's and the Free Kings all in the 20 days we hiked. All of course pretty important holidays. The positive thing was that there were nearly no other pilgrims. A bad thing was that many of the accommodations were closed, especially the pilgrims accommodations. Well, anyway, there are multiple ways and links we used to find those accommodations. I have four ways for you to check out. First one is the app. There it will show you mostly all the pilgrims accommodations, which are usually pretty basic, but should also be quite cheap, but no guarantee on that. If you can't find any place that occurs to your, to your demand, check out the Via Francigena website or the tourism sites for Tuscany or Lazio. I don't get anything from all the companies I mentioned here, so if you want to support me in any way, hit the subscribe button and watch my videos. Thank you very much and back to topic. The fourth and last resource we came back to when there were no options left was booking.com. Depending on how frequent you use this app, you will get some discount or upgrades in some facilities. I heard from a lot of people that they just asked at churches, monasteries or other religious places and that they were treated friendly and accommodated very well. We made the experience that the religious places we used were pretty overpriced, we were at least once welcomed pretty rude and also they are absolutely uncomfortable. So, like mentioned before, I would rather stay in a comfortable bed and breakfast and pay 5 euro more than staying in an uncomfortable place where I feel not welcomed at all. Another question is when to book those accommodations. We made it like this. We sent an email to the accommodation two days in advance. If they didn't answer, we had to make a call. Now, I speak a little Italian and most of the time it was enough to let the people understand that we want to sleep at the places <laughs> or at least that we're gonna arrive soon or today or whatever. The thing is 90% of the people who will host you don't speak any English or German, Spanish if you're lucky, French was offered I think once. This is one of the biggest challenges, the language barrier. The pilgrims accommodations usually don't have a website and most of them don't answer to, to emails. So you will have to call them. Just appearing there won't help you as most of the accommodations are just for pilgrims to sleep and nobody's actually living there. Maybe this is a, bit, a little bit different in summer that there are always people there but in winter they are totally closed and you have to call them when you arrive or better in advance so they know that you're coming and they can open the place. So like mentioned earlier when you're traveling through low season prepare for a lot of calls because many of the places will be closed. On the other hand, when you travel in peak season, make sure you book maybe one, two, three days in advance, so you definitely get your bed. So how are the accommodations along the route? Well, you will be able to find everything from the absolute simple dormitories up until some kind of luxurious bed and breakfasts or hotels. One thing I have to say here is check and if possible ask how much the dormitories are and what you get for it. If you saw the videos you know that we paid for one dormitory 21 euros per person which is in my opinion pretty much because we didn't get anything. We just got the bed, we got a blanket which was 0.5 or something we had to share the bathroom where it, there was only one shower and one toilet in the same room with four other pilgrims which is not cool that's not cool for the price you know and call you know there was not even a fucking wi-fi in my opinion those accommodations are just very overpriced because you don't get anything and you pay pretty much on the other hand we paid 25 euros per person for a really beautiful and lovely bed and breakfast with a big private bathroom with a very comfortable bed. In the, on the, in the morning we even got a little 
Italian breakfast. It really pays off if you do a little bit of research before booking an accommodation. Also, sometimes, of course, according to the season, you don't have many choices, but if you have the choices, better check them out. Talking about research, that is sometimes also a little bit tricky. At the app and also at the websites, sometimes it is listed which accommodation has which facilities. Well, that's often not really up to date, so if possible, ask before booking an overpriced place. They vary. A handful of places are based on donations, but most of them have fixed prices. Most of the pilgrims accommodations are 15 euros, but also this changes from town to town. And then the bed and breakfasts, guest houses or hotels are mostly somewhere between 25 to 30 euros per person per night. And of course you can always find more expensive places. At the end of the video we will show you how much we spend on our walk. Very important, if you hike the whole day, you gotta refill your batteries with some great food. And luckily we're in Italy and there is plenty of great food. In most of the towns you will find a lot of restaurants. Keep in mind that in Italy restaurants are usually closed from 12 to 2 or 3 p.m. and reopen at around 6 to 7 p.m. Some places offer special pilgrims menus. They, there were not many, at least in winter, but maybe that changes when the season is more buzzy. They are also not the cheapest as most of them were around 20 euro, but it's quite a lot as you usually get first and second course and a drink. So if you are really hungry, that's maybe the best way to go. There is also the option to cook for yourself as some accommodations have kitchen facilities. Is it suitable for vegetarians or vegans? I would say yes, but your options will be a bit limited. The Italian and in this case especially the Tuscan or Laziani kitchen are pretty focused on meat. Also classical for Italy are the seafood restaurants. But in a pizzeria you will always have both vegetarian and also vegan options. Pizza marinara for example is without cheese, ask for any other toppings. Also sometimes you'll even get vegetarian or vegan pasta options. The tap water along the Via Francigena is very different from town to town. Some of them have the best fresh water, in other towns the water tastes like it was already flushed down the toilet. So you can't really be sure if there is good water and for the sake of not buying plastic bottles every day I would really recommend buying filter systems like LifeStraw. This is what we use during the Via Francigena and I use it since years and I'm really happy with it. At some places you have freshwater fountains but they are very unregular, so you should not count on them. If you're a citizen of the European Union, this is maybe not so important to you. But if you are from the UK, Switzerland or overseas, you maybe would like to have Wi-Fi from time to time to plan your next steps, watch porn or just tell your family that you are still alive. So you should know that most of the pilgrims facilities don't offer Wi-Fi. Which really made me a bit mad for the price that some of them demand. Here are some tips and tricks I always use when doing a long distance hike. No matter if it's a walk along the road or an alpine trail. First of all, dear Tello, Hirschteig in German. I never want to do a hike again without it. It's making your feet soft and therefore preventing them from getting blisters. I did one day on the Via Francigena without it and immediately got blisters. It's really something I think shouldn't be missed in any pilgrim's backpack. In case of blisters, don't forget blister plasters. Another thing I use since years to prevent sore muscles and pain is magnesium. You can get capsules or tablets which dissolve in water in most supermarkets and pharmacies. You just need one of them per day or every other day. Don't go too hard on that magnesium, overdosing gives you massive diarrhea and that's the last thing you want to have on a pilgrimage. If you already have sore muscles or pain in your feet, use Annika ointment. 
By the way, most important, I'm just a random guy in a YouTube video. I'm not a nutritionist or a doctor. Everything I'm telling you now is based on my experience while doing long distance hikes. So I don't guarantee for anything. <laughs> So let's get to potential dangers. First of all, there are a lot of dogs on the Via Francigena. Many of them are friendly and some of them will even want to join on in the walk with you. But most of them will hysterically bark at you for no reason and some maybe even attempt to get close to you. While the chance of getting bitten by a dog is pretty low, it still exists as Amy had to learn on her Camino Franques hike. Sadly, many of the dogs along the way are not taken well care of or trained. So you should take care and if feeling really threatened, it works in many cases to imitate the move like throwing something at the dog. In the worst case, actually throw something. But try not to hit the dog, but just like throw, throw a stone right next to it and that usually they, they move. No guarantee on that. Way more dangerous than the dogs is the traffic. Many, many kilometers of the path follow main roads. Means they are really busy, used by trucks, buses and a shitload of cars. Just take care, try to walk as far on the side of the road as possible. Throwing a stone at upcoming cars will most probably not scare them away. I really hope we could help you with this little video and um, now of course I want to give you a summary of some of my last thoughts about the Via Francigena. Would I walk those stages again? Probably not. And I know I criticized a lot about this walk in the videos and also now, but I don't want to put it in negative light for everybody. But I just want to be honest and tell you what I think about some topics. A person who likes little towns with a lot of history and prefers easy walks will absolutely love this trail I think. And that I feel overwhelmed when entering Rome because I'm a little misanthrope doesn't mean you will not enjoy this city with its thousands of years of history. Also for me there are good things otherwise we wouldn't have finished the trail. Like the beauty of nature we witnessed by visiting the Geyser or the incredible thermal springs of San Filippo. I also really enjoyed the many friendly locals we encountered while walking. Especially the guy in the museum in Fucecchio or the 94 year old woman who hosted us in San Gimignano. And with some better planning I think even for us the Via Francigena could have been a bit more enjoyable. So I hope with this little video we managed to help you avoiding our mistakes and having a more relaxed hike. Thank you very much for watching and bon camino!